Now, there will be an opportunity for us to take a few questions from Twitter. Uh, at the end of this, this is just a 10-minute conversation, but if you tweet real fast, as soon as he says something you want to react to, or if there's always something you wanted to ask Rashad, but you didn't have him over to dinner, uh, tweet using hashtags on the screen behind us. All panelists' Twitter handles can be found in your program. So if we assume that Dr. King's biggest successes were changing policies of official institutional racism and that the words aren't written down to be officially institutionally racist today, is the challenge for you in 2016 at Color of Change fighting governmental institutional racism different? Absolutely. Um, 2016 and beyond is not just about changing the written rules of policy that govern our lives, um, whether it's about changing rules around how prosecutors deal with police violence, whether it's about changing rules about money in our political system, but it's about changing a whole set of unwritten rules from how Hollywood um, informs our lives through the images that they put out, whether it's about um, how the unwritten rules that govern our everyday lives, not just about the rules of prosecutors, but how we use our political system to get bad prosecutors out of office. So civil rights today is not just about the marches and the work to hold government accountable, but it's about changing our culture. It's about holding corporations and holding our media accountable just as much as we hold our government accountable. When, when we talked on the phone last week, um, you mentioned cultivating allies, including non-African Americans, to join the battle against institutional racism. Why is it important, and how do you do it differently than in King's Day? You know, so much about how people see, particularly black people, is as symbols, right? Symbols for what's wrong with our education system. The media uses us as symbols for um, what's wrong with our health care or our government, and oftentimes not even treating black people as real people, talking about black people. And even those folks that sometimes see us as allies, or we're supposed to see as allies, the, the, the folks on the left, um, we get shout outs from the stage, we get empathy, but, but no real sort of sense of power. In 2016 and beyond, for black people, for all oppressed people, it's about translating awareness on our issues into real power. It's translating presence into power and not mistaking presence that we have a black man as president, that we get, we trend on social media, that we have TV shows that represent our stories for real power, because that's not the power to change the incentive structures about how we're treated, to change the ways that we are treated by those in power. Translating presence into power is ex what we have to think about as we work to build a new world for black people and for all people. And that's going to be about bringing more voices into this work, bringing allies into this work, but understanding that it's not just about talking about our issues or being aware about our issues. It's about ensuring that black people truly have power to change the incentive structure of this country. And how important to that and those alliances do you think it is for white people to say out loud the words white privilege and confront their white privilege and talk to each other about white privilege. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I think it's important, but I think those are just words, right? That's once again just presence. And so I'm not interested in white people just saying white privilege if it doesn't actually mean anything different than what it meant the day before. I'm interested in having a conversation about white privilege if it actually changes the incentive structure about how we fund public education in this country. I'm actually having a conversation around white privilege if it means about changing how we think about corporate power in this country, if it, if it changes how we think about how we try police officers who kill unarmed black people in this country. That's when I'm interested in having a conversation about white privilege. I'm interested in having a conversation not just about presence. I'm interested in having a conversation about power. And, and in having a conversation about power, I see that your organization, Color of Change, has a super PAC. And I think more of the Koch brothers and people like that when I think of super PACs, not civil rights and social justice organizations. So what kind of a super PAC do you have and why? 
well, we have a political action committee. It's not actually um, a super PAC. They're like two different types of political action committees, but we have a political action committee because we believe um, at Color of Change that we have a 501c3, we have a C4, and we have a PAC because we believe that black people are not going to get free just by the IRS codes around tax deductible donations and, um, and that the IRS is not necessarily interested in black people getting free. So I say that to say that that we have a pact because we understand that we've got to build more energy around bad prosecutors, around people that we want to get out of office, but we also have to raise the type of money that moves political action into the races around the country that we need to get the bad folks out of office and get good people into office, and that can't happen just on a 501c3. I, I gather, and I think it's really interesting that you're focusing a lot of your efforts this year on elections for local DA. Yeah. And, you know, so much of our work this past couple of years around criminal, this criminal justice moment that we're in has been about calling on the federal government to, you know, do a database for police killings, to call on the federal government to get involved in Ferguson, to get involved in Sanford, Florida, to get involved in Baltimore, to get involved in all these moments where there's been uprisings of voices, voices of everyday black folks who want to be heard and counted and visible, and they want to do so equally. Uh, whether they're privileged or vulnerable, majority or minority, or in favor or out of favor with those in power, there's something universal about that in our democracy. But that won't happen without building real power. So we're also talking about what happens at the local level. Because just like a good doctor, you don't want to go in the office if something is wrong with your liver that you're operating on your heart. And there's something wrong with our criminal justice system at the local level. And there's something wrong with prosecutors who don't feel accountable and are not incentivized to do the right thing. So we've got to get them out of office. And we've got to build the power to get them out of office. And Color of Change as a national civil rights organization with over 1.3 million black folks and their allies of every race that works to mobilize people online and offline feels it's our particular job to be in this space to build the type of power that holds folks accountable. And when they get out of office, to remind them that they got out of office because they did wrong. And to remind the folks who get in office the next time that there will be someone watching them and holding them accountable and is not interested in taking big corporate money um, along the way. All right, we've got a couple of questions that have come in via Twitter already for some, from some very fast tweeters. Um, and this first one says, will the Constitution ever protect the entirety of all Americans? You know, I think this goes right, right back to what I'm saying about presence to power. The Constitution, right, is a document that has evolved over time, and it has represented over time how people have built power. And, and we are here to celebrate the legacy of Dr. King, who raised the voices, not just of black folks, but the consciousness of people of all races around the country to make our Constitution, to make this document representative of the, the voices of that time. And there were so many different policies that came out of that, from the Voting Rights Act to the Civil Rights Act, and those were the best policies of that time. They were the best policies we could get of that era. So much of the civil rights movement that we see today is trying to defend and protect those we have to not just defend and protect those, but we have to advance. We have to think about what are the civil rights policies of our future, the policies that bring the voices of the modern issues that we're dealing with, whether it's the voices of black folks or new immigrant communities or LGBT voices, the intersectional movements of our time that give everyday people a more powerful voice, a more powerful voice in our democracy, and push back against this trend of corporate power that pushes us all down, that increases income equality and makes us all less powerful in our community. So, so to the extent that the Constitution in and of itself is a, is a piece of paper, we, we the people have to express our will for a better future. And we have to do that by building power and connecting our voices and holding those in power accountable and putting people we want to see in power, you know, there to do the right thing. Another question? from the audience tweeted by Anamata Priya <laughs> asks, how can we inspire and engage agents of active empathy? I think, um, 
you know, agents of active empathy, we have to give them something to do. That's so much of what we think about as a color of change is that we hear so much in this sort of modern day era of technology and online tools of, of, of you know, hashtag activism or clicktivism. At color of change, we really think about in the moment when something happens, how do we give something, body something clear to do? So in the moment, the aftermath of Trayvon Martin, we found out that there was this organization called the American Legislative Exchange Council that was behind the Stand Your Ground law that was shielding George Zimmerman. They were this right-wing group that created model, what they called model legislation. They were also behind the discriminatory voter ID law and the Arizona immigration policy. We mobilized our members not to hold ALEC accountable, but to hold the corporations that were supporting ALEC. 98% of ALEC's money came from corporations. Corporations who every single day came into our community and said, buy our products and use our services. And we went to those corporations and said, you can't come for black folks' money by day and try to take away our vote or make us unsafe by night. And what we did was we mobilized our members and said, this is where we go. Over 100 corporations have now left ALEC because of our members' voices. They have a $1.5 million budget shortfall. They had to close down their swanky office in DC and move to a much smaller office in Virginia, and all because of the voices of everyday black folks saying, not today. We will not just do things the old way. We will not take your money, but we will mobilize our members and push for a different type of results. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Rashad Robinson.